Okay, let's uh, resume our session for the afternoon with our, our second speaker, who is Udit Mavin Kurvi, and he will speak on us for us to the, on the fundamental propoids in discrete homotopy theory. Uh, okay, um, thanks for the introduction. And thank you for the organizers for organizing this wonderful seminar, uh, conference, in fact. Um, and all the speakers so far, uh, the talks have really uh, enjoyed. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about um, the fundamental groupoid and discrete homotopy theory. So this is based on joint work with my advisor, Chris Kapulkin. Um, so let me give sort of a brief history of this subject. So um, the modern foundations for discrete homotopy theory were laid by Helen Barcelo and collaborators in 2001 when they first, um, so the, I, this idea is dated back to like the 70s, uh, but uh, it was given its modern setting in the category of graphs in 2001. And then uh, more higher homotopy groups were described in 2006. And then we have a paper in 2019 by Rachel Hardiman, which talks about uh, covering theory, which I'm also going to touch upon um, today in my talk. Uh, and Bob Lutz has a paper on higher discrete homotopy groups of graphs, where he actually shows that there exist graphs um, with uh, non-trivial higher homotopy groups in for any dimension. So you the use so this it's hard discrete homotopy theory is truly different than just the usual homotopy um, groups of graphs treated as one dimensional CW complexes. Mm -hmm. And then there was a conjecture uh, in 2006 uh, in the paper by Babson, Barcelo, and uh, collaborators. And this was proved in the 2022 paper by Daniel Carranza and Chris Kapulkin, the cubicle setting for discrete homotopy theory revisited. And finally, uh, this is the paper, the fundamental group point in discrete homotopy theory, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So let's get into it. So what is discrete homotopy theory? So let's introduce the players. So a graph for us is a set equipped with a symmetric reflexive relation. Okay, so the set is the set of vertices. And we say that if two vertices um, which are related but not equal, we, we can draw an edge between them. And because it's a symmetric relation, uh, we can draw an undirected edge. And because it's also a reflexive relation, there's going to be a unique loop present at each vertex, but we are just going to suppress that. But they're relevant, that becomes relevant when we look at graph maps. So a graph map is a function that preserves the relation. So in particular, this means that edges between vertices in the domain can either be mapped to edges in Y or the codomain, or they can be contracted to a single vertex, which basically means it's contracted to the loop at a single vertex. So we write graph for the category of graphs and graph maps, and that's the setting uh, in which the homotopy theory is defined. So let's look at some examples of graphs. So we have the finite intervals, the uh, n, n interval graph. So the z, i0 is just the uh, terminal object in the category. i1 is you have two vertices and then there's in one edge between them. i2 is three vertices and two edges. And similarly, we have the infinite interval with an, uh, an integer, a vertex for each integer and an edge between consecutive integers. And then we have the n cycles for n greater than three. So we have c3. C4 and C5 drawn on the screen for you. So it's just uh, your vertices are labeled by uh, your Z mod N, integers mod N, and you have an edge between consecutive integers in Z mod N. Okay. So we talked about interval graphs in a previous uh, slide. So to do any homotopy theory, we need two ingredients, the interval and the box product. So this is the sec uh, or just a notion of a product. So this is the notion of a product that is used in discrete homotopy theory called box product. So it's defined as follows. On vertices, you just take ordered pairs of vertices from the two graphs. And we say that there's an edge between two vertices and the product if this condition is satisfied. So either you have an edge in the first uh, direction and an equality in the second direction or an equality in the first direction and an edge in the second direction. So maybe let's this will become more clear when we look at some examples. So if we take the i1 graph, which is just two, uh, which is just a single edge, non-identity edge, and take the box product of that with itself, we get the four-cycle graph. So important to note is that um, 
if you had taken the categorical product in this category, you would have gotten uh, four vertices, but you would have also gotten the diagonals. Whereas the box product is a genuinely new monoidal structure in which the diagonal is absent. And just for like visual visualizing, I've also provided a drawing for C3 box I1. Okay, so now that we have our ingredients for um, defining homotopy theory, let's get into that. Um, so if you have two graphs X and Y, and you have two graph maps F and G from X to Y, we can define something known as an A homotopy. So the A actually stands for a mathematician called Atkins, who originated this theory. Um, so that's um, that's going to be a graph map from X box I N. So any uh, int N interval. So you're allowed to vary um, the length of the interval into y, such that at zero it's f and it's n it's g. So the usual notion of homotopy that you'd expect with in, with the n finite interval replacing the unit interval in topology and the box product replacing the usual Cartesian product of topological spaces. And then we say it's an hom a homotopy equivalence if there exists a map in the reverse direction such that both compositions are homotopic in this uh, sense to the identity maps. So let's look at some examples. So you have n interval is contractible, which is what you would expect. Um, um, you can basically um, uh, at each step you can um, you can reduce one vertex and get down to the uh, terminal object. Maybe what's a little bit more surprising is the infinite interval is not contractible. So this is again something that's different. So the I infinity sort of models the real line um, in in this setting, but in this setting it's not contractible, and that's basically because you have parts of arbitrary lengths, and you would need a homotopy of um, of size of length n to contract a path of length n, like at least a homotopy of length n, and because you have parts of arbitrary length, there is no such homotopy which uh, which would make which would contract I infinity. Perhaps some even more surprising examples is that C three and C four, which we sort of think of as modeling S one in this setting, are also contractible. So I'm going to give the diagram for these homotopies. So these are maps. Uh, so in the first case, on the left here, we have a map from C three box I one to C three. So the way I've depicted this map, this graph map, is by drawing the domain and labeling the vertices of the domain by the element in the codomain that it is mapped to. So here we see that at um, at the zero level we have the identity on C three, and on the one level we have the constant map at zero. And similarly for C four, we have a homotopy of length two, where we first smush it along the like one direction, so we get um, so. 2, 3 is collapsed onto 0, 1. And then in the second uh, step, we collapse 0, 1 to, to just 0. So in both cases, we see that C3 and C4 are contractible. And this sort of argument stops holding when you're working with higher, uh, with larger cycles. So C5 and so on will not be contractible as we'll, we'll see later on in this talk. Um, and then, of course, we can describe some homotopy invariants. So let x be a graph and x and x prime be two vertices. We describe a path as a map out of I infinity, so the, the real line in graph theory, for which there exist integers such that outside this range from n minus to n plus, it's so on the left, it's constant x, and on the right, it's constant x prime. So all the interesting thing is happening in a finite region. But we are allowing parts to be of arbitrary length. We don't want to fix the length. So this is why we map out of infinity rather than out of a specific I n. And then we can def define the fundamental group A1, X, X naught of a pointed graph as parts in X from X naught to itself. So basically loops. And then you mod that out by a notion of based homotopy. So just like you have, so I defined homotopies in the previous slide. So you can define relative homotopies in a similar way. So you have a notion of pointed or based homotopies. So that get, allows you to define the fundamental group. Okay, so that's a sort of a quick introduction to discrete homotopy theory, but what is it really good for? So it actually um, uh, detects some a lot of combinatorial data about graphs and the fundamental group especially has found applications in a wide variety of uh, areas of maths. And sort of the very first application was in Metroid theory, 
where uh, associated to any matroid, you can construct a graph where the vertices are given by bases of the matroids and you have an edge between two bases if they differ by base exchange. So that's one of the definitions of matroids. And you can ask the question, when is a graph um, realized as the basis graph of a matroid? And one of the conditions that Maura comes up with is that the fundamental group is trivial. So it's simply connected in, in the sense of a homotopy theory. And then we also have uh, applications to hyperplane arrangements, again, by Barcelo and collaborators. And most recently, and maybe a little more exciting in these times, is applications of topological data analysis, where you can define persistent homotopy groups of metric spaces via the discrete fundamental group. Um, OK. so. Let's actually define the main object in the title, the fundamental groupoid. So this is a category, and the objects are given by vertices of your graph, and morphisms are given by path homotopy classes of paths in, in the graph. So we saw what paths and path homotopy classes are, so we use that to define the fundamental groupoid. And of course, if you have a pointed graph, then you could recover the fundamental group by just taking the automorphism group of that uh, of that object in the fundamental groupoid. So it's just a multi-object generalization. Um, and so in our paper, we proved that the fundamental groupoid, which is a functor from uh, the category of graphs to the category of groupoids, is actually strict monoidal. Um, and this can be used to prove that uh, the fundamental groupoid is actually a homotopy invariant. And I think it's the first proof in literature that the fundamental group itself is a uh, homotopy invariant. I think it was just assumed um, in, in the previous literature. Okay, so this so that was just the definition of the fundamental groupoid. So this is sort of an overview of what of the results we prove in our paper. So the first section of the new section is about a finite formulation of the homotopy groups, which I won't be talking about much today. But essentially, um, if you if you remember the definition of paths, we define it as uh, maps out of I infinity. And similarly, homotopy groups um, can be high homotopy groups can be defined by taking maps out of I infinity tensored n times or boxed n times. And the problem with this definition is that it's hard to run induction arguments on path lengths. So we define uh, maps, uh, homotopy groups as maps out of I n tensor uh, m times or d times uh, according to dimension. But the problem is you want to vary the length. So there is some technical technicality to, uh, to make this equivalent definition. Okay, uh, but let me just sort of uh, leave that to Q&A at the end if anyone's interested but I will be directly going to covering graphs. So, so in a graph, there is a well-known, well-understood notion of a neighborhood that would sort of model like topology, like open neighborhoods in a graph. And what that basically is, is um, the neighborhood of a vertex is basically a subgraph of X where you only look at the neighbors of X and you have an edge drawn between X and each of its neighbors. So it's like a star neighborhood of, of each vertex in a graph. And so we have a notion of a local isomorphism. So graph map is a local isomorphism if it re restricts to isomorphisms between the neighborhoods at each vertex and it's the neighborhood of its image for, the, for, for this map. So this sort of uh, so, um, models, um, this this sort of uh, what you would expect to define in graph theory. So this, this is a very classical definition. But um, the paper that I mentioned before by Rachel Hardiman uses uh, local isomorphism as the definition of covering graphs, which actually has some limitations because um, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't behave nicely when you're looking at lifting path homotopies. So then you have to sort of restrict the class of graphs uh, to which this theory is applicable to graphs without three or four cycles. So this sort of problematic. So in our paper, we use a new notion called a covering map, which in addition to being a local isomorphism, has right lifting against this map, which I have denoted by this um, open box. Which, which is a map from I3, which is the interval with three uh, edges, to I1 box I1, which was the square. So we are basically selecting three edges of the uh, four cycle. And we're saying that any local isomorphism that has this lifting property 
right left wing property is called a covering. So as an example, uh, we can think of the map from I infinity to CN, which basically wraps the infinite interval around your n cycle uh, by mapping I to I mod n. So this is going to be a local isomorphism for all n because each neighborhood is basically just I2. So you have a vertex and then you have two edges on the left and the right, and that's a local isomorphism. But it's actually a covering only for n greater than five because for n is equal to three or n equal to four, you have a three cycle or a four cycle in the in the base, but you can't lift that to a three cycle or a four cycle in I infinity. Whereas it is uh, for n greater than equal to five, there are no three or four cycles in the base. So hence, uh, this is trivially a covering. Okay. So we write um, cov of x for the full subcategory of the slice category on coverings. And then we actually have a classification theorem which says that the category of coverings is equivalent to set valued functors from the fundamental groupoid. And when we restrict to pointed connected graphs, we actually recover the Galois correspondence between connected coverings over a pointed graph with the subgroups of the fundamental groupoid ordered by inclusion or reverse inclusion. And just as uh, you would do with topological spaces, you can define a notion of a universal cover. So we say that a pointed covering is a universal cover if it's initial in the category of pointed coverings over the pointed graph. And in our paper, we proved that every pointed graph admits a universal cover. And this construction is sort of, again, what you would see in topological spaces where the vertices of your universal cover are given by path homotopy classes of paths that begin at X naught. And the base point is given by the constant path at x naught, the path homotopy class of the R. And so we prove that the map from uh, this construction to x is actually a covering map and that it is initial in this category. Um, we also prove that uh, pointed covering is universal if and only if the covering graph is simply connected. So simply connected in, with respect to the A homotopy groups. So the fundamental group is trivial and it's path connected. And then we can recover the fundamental group of the base graph by looking at automorphisms of the universal cover. So this result was uh, sort of there in Rachel Hardiman's paper, but uh, it only applied to graphs uh, without three or four cycles. So the first result, which is that every pointed graph admits a universal cover is genuinely new. And as an example, we can see that uh, the three and four cycle, which are contractible, as itself as a universal cover. So the identity map is the universal cover. That's what you'd expect for something that's contractible. For n greater than five, the map from I infinity to CN, which sort of wraps I infinity around CN, that is a universal cover. So because I infinity is simply connected. And as a corollary, we prove that A1 of the N cycle is trivial if n is three or four. So three or four cycles which were contractible. So that so that gives you a trivial uh, homotopy fundamental group. But for any n greater than or equal to five, you get that the pre-image uh, or the automorphisms of the universal cover that's going to be infinite uh, and you get Z as your fundamental group. Okay, how am I doing in time? Okay. So next we go to Van Kampen theorem, which is um, the what you would do with topology. You sort of uh, use covering theory to compute the fundamental group of S1. And the next thing you do is Van Kampen theorem. So we just do that. Um, so let's introduce some notation to first uh, to state the theorem. So map between an M interval and an N interval is called shrinking if it's order preserving and surjective. So this is an example of a shrinking map from I8 to I4. So again, I've drawn I8 and I've labeled the vertices of I8 by the vertex of I4 that was mapped to. So you can see that's order preserving and that goes from zero to four, it's subjective. Okay, so we have a notion called a net. So if X is a graph and H is a map from I1 box I1 into X, so it can be a four cycle, a three cycle, or something even degenerate. Um, so net of this such a map is going to be a pair consisting of a map H, big H, from IM box IN. So it's so if you think of I, I1 box I1 as a one, one by one grid, so you're basically subdividing it into an M by N grid. 
And together with the shrinking map for, uh, from I sub 2M plus 2N to I4, such that uh, this condition uh, is satisfied. Uh, so let's look at like an example, and maybe that will help see what this really means. So if you have a uh, map from I1 cross I1 to X, that's basically just um, a square labeled with vertices of X. And what we're saying is that we have um, a map from a bigger thing, uh, I M box I N, so that on the boundary of uh, on the boundary, it basically agrees with the boundary of the the smaller grid that you have up to a shrinking map. So you can sort of repeat some vertices, but otherwise you're basically the same uh, boundary. So it's a sort of subdivision or, or a net of of this uh, grid. Okay, so now we're ready to state the Van Kampen theorem. So recall that Van Kampen theorem is a result about pushouts. And so we look at pushout squares and graph, and we say that if every map I1 box I1 in the pushout graph X, whose image in X is either three or four cycle, if such a map admits a net H comma S, such that each cell, so in the previous uh, drawing, we can think of um, this, is an, this is a map from I2 cross I2. So we have four uh, cells, H11, H12, H21, and H22. So these are basically the smaller one by one um, maps sitting inside your M by N grid. So if each cell H sub IJ of uh, I comma J of H factors through one of the graphs that you're taking the push out of, so this is a sort of technical condition, then the push out square is preserved by the functor, which basically means you have a push out, uh, the push out of the, uh, the fundamental groupoid of the push out is the push out of the fundamental groupoid. So there was a version of Van Campbell theorem in literature proven by uh, Barcelo and collaborators, which actually required that every three or four cycle in the push out graph is actually contained in either X1 or X2. Uh, we actually say that that's not necessary. We can basically subdivide your three or four cycles and require that each cell in your subdivision factors through X1 or X2. So it's a, we prove a stronger version by weakening the hypothesis that uh, is needed to be satisfied by the pushout square. So I don't have time to give like a simple example for which this improved Van Kampen theorem is applicable, but the old one wasn't. But we're going to use the Van Kampen theorem to uh, uh, go to the next part of our talk, which is um, constructing graphs with the prescribed fundamental group. So a natural question to ask is, um, well, you have you have um, a functor from graphs to groupoids or graphs to groups. So which groups or which groupoids can be realized as a fundamental group or fundamental groupoid of a graph in the in the sense of a homotopy theory? And we proved that actually every group can be realized or every groupoid can be realized as the fundamental group or groupoid of a graph. And the construction is again what you would expect from uh, topology. So we define the m comma n disk d sub m n by taking this m cycle and then taking the product of that with the uh, n interval. So we basically get an, a cylinder and we are collapsing one of the, uh, we're collapsing it at uh, zero. Right, so we're identifying all vertices i comma zero with j comma zero. So that's basically a cone on your uh, cone of length n on a cycle of length uh, or cycle of uh, radius m. And we define the boundary map from C m to D m comma n by sending i to i comma n. So that's the usual inclusion. So here's an example. So on the left we have the five cycle, and on the right we have d five comma three which is by taking a uh, product of the five cycle with the three interval and then collapsing everything at zero. Okay. Now, if you have a set S and let F sub S be the free group generated by the set S, then for any word in the free group, uh, let's call it R, but let's think of it as S1 to the D1 of multiplied by uh, and so on to SK to the DK. So these are your generators, S1 to SK are your generators and your set. And D1 uh, are can be integers, so they can be negative, they can be positive. So you can, you can define the degree of R to be the sum of the absolute values of all these exponents. And then we can define a sort of a gluing map, omega sub R, corresponding to the word R as follows. So what we do is we take a cycle of sufficiently big size. So we take particularly five times the degree of R, 
and then we map it to the wedge of five cycles such that it it maps d1 times around the first the c5 corresponding to s1 so it can be clockwise if d1 is positive counterclockwise if d1 is negative and then d2 times around the c5 corresponding to cs2 and so on so basically taking a big um, cycle and uh, mapping it to gluing it to um, a wedge of uh, smaller cycles and that's the gluing maps that we're using so let g be any group with a presentation uh, s and r so s is your set of generators and r is your set of relations um, we define this graph, we construct this graph as follows. So we take the wedge of um, five cycles. So remember that five cycles were the sort of smallest cycles that were non-trivial. C3 and C4 was contractible, so we need to take C5. I mean, you could take a bigger C, uh, cycle, but C5 is sort of the optimal one. And then you take um, your disks of, um, of size five times degree of R, and radius three, and you glue them to this wedge of C5s. You have one C5 for each generator in your set, and you have one disk for each relation. And for each relation, you glue the disk along this uh, wedge corresponding to the gluing map that we have, we defined in the previous, and you take the push out of this diagram. And so we proved that given any group with this presentation, um, the fundamental group of this construction that we do is actually recovers the group that we started out with. And the proof of this uses Van Kampen theorem, of course, because we work with pushouts. Okay. Um, and we can actually strengthen this. So the previous uh, statement is stated for groups, but of course, if you have a groupoid, you can take just a disjoint union of, um, um, yeah, you can take a disjoint union of these graphs, and that would give you uh, something that's equivalent to your groupoid. And it's even better, we can go one step better. If you have a functor from a groupoid uh, G to the fundamental group of um, a graph Y, so let's call it F, then we can construct a map, a graph map, little f from X to Y, such that it approx pi one of F approximates F. So you have a zigzag of uh, equivalence of so groupoids uh, between G and pi one of X, and this square commutes. So this sort of like just uh, bootstrapping from the previous result. Uh, okay, so just one minute. So I'm going to talk about future goals of this project. So we can define a map, uh, a graph map to be a weak one equivalence if it induces a bijection on the path components and an isomorphism on the fun groupoid for all base points. And let W sub uh, less than equal to one be the class of weak one equivalences. And we can ask if um, the relative category graph comma weak one equivalence is, is a homotopy equivalent to the category of groupoids. Or what we're basically asking is up to one, weak one equivalences, is, is the homotopy, is a homotopy theory the same as the homotopy theory of spaces, right? Which is given by groupoids. More generally, we can talk about high homotopy groups and we can define weak n equivalences and ask if it's homotopy equivalent to weak n groupoids. And the approach that we think should work is vibration categories. And the reason for that is we have this theorem of Chizinski, uh, who says that an exact functor between two vibration category, uh, two vibration categories induces an equivalence on the homotopy categories if and only if it satisfies the following approximation properties. So F reflects the functor should reflect weak equivalences. And the second property is precisely the um the property that we proved for the fundamental groupoid. Um, two slides back. Yeah, this one. So we think that this approximation property can actually give us uh, a proof that pi one, the fundamental groupoid, is an exact functor between um, the theory of homotopy theory of graphs up to weak one equivalences and that of groupoids. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your time. Let's thank uh, Utit again. Now, and are there questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Um, Go ahead, Jack. So, so first off, this was an awesome talk. Uh, thanks for doing this. Oh, um, thank you. And um, 
I wanted to ask you, so you mentioned that there's like higher homotopical data encoded in these graphs, which is not something I expected. Um, mm. You have some sort of interpretation of a graph in this way as like a topological space. Can you turn a graph into a space? Like, yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. So the key objects are basically your um, I1 box, um, I1, like, and you can take the box n times. And you can, if you think of a graph as a one-dimensional CW complex, you can glue in an N cell to a graph uh, to this one-dimensional CW complex for each map out of this, out of this, um, like N cube, right? And that that would give you an infinite-dimensional CW complex. And there, were, so the beginning uh, in the references. So I mentioned this paper in two thousand six, which conjectured that the discrete uh, homotopy group um, of the graphs of these graphs would agree with the usual homotopy groups of the topological space that you get out of this construction. And this was actually proved by my advisor and his student, Daniel Carranza, in 2022. Yeah. So there is a relation. Yeah. That's cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Christoph, we want to go ahead, go next. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. And I, I just have a naive question. Like, uh, mm -hmm. is there a Quillan model structure on the category of graphs whose uh, Weak equivalences are, let's say, maps which induce uh, an isomorphism in all the higher uh, homotopy groups, and the homotopy equivalences are the ones that you define. Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, there's no equivalent model structure, and um, so there's a paper called. Um, so I forgot the actual name, but I think it says um, it's something like limits don't exist in naive homotopy discrete homotopy theory. Um, if you go to like my advisor's website, you could find this uh, paper. Um, so there is no model structure, but we can do something. We can uh, so we have we have half of a model structure. We have a vibration category structure where the weak equivalences are um, weak homotopy equivalences. So they induce isomorphisms on all the homotopy discrete homotopy groups. Yeah. Is there, for example, a Whitehead's theorem that uh, for certain graphs these. Uh... Something is think, a equivalence if and only if it is induces size of evolved. No, that's an open problem as far as I know, because um if we look at um let's let's see I infinity. So I said that I infinity was not contractible, but all the homotopy groups of I infinity are trivial. So it is weakly contractible. So so um it's not clear what graph what class of graphs you would expect that if it's yeah, we, if it's weakly contractible, it's contractible. Like even that problem is not not yet well understood yet. Yeah, that's an open problem. Thank you. Yes. Brandon, you next. Hey, uh, yeah, so th thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah. This might be a little bit out there, but since you suggested you're looking into whether uh, the extent to which graphs might be a model for the homotopy theory of spaces, mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a chance that maybe if you use like directed graphs or something instead, you might be able to model infinity one categories? Oh, um, that's interesting. I haven't thought about it, honestly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting thing to explore, definitely. Yeah, maybe you start looking at like directed homotopy theory at that point or something. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. You know, just like literally graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I had a quick question myself. Um, kind of, that's, I was wondering how complicated do the graphs get um, to model all the different uh, homotopy groups? Like for man, for uh, for spaces, we know that we can do this with, um, I think, four dimensional manifolds or something. I might get that wrong, but um, is your are your graphs just modeled on the on the on the result for spaces or is it is it something that can actually be done more efficiently or differently um so the so you're asking what the construction that i gave was yeah the or basically kind of the what's i say the complexity of it um if that's right. a great way to say it and if this gets complicated we can talk about it later i i, I don't so there's no notion of a dimension i guess for graphs um, yeah, I realize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I know that it's sort of um, 
if you think of the space that you, uh, you want and you sort of like discretize it by thinking of three and four cycles as being two cells, mm -hmm. um, you essentially um, can get an intuition for what the graph that you want to construct should be. Okay. Um, and so one thing that I was trying to do is construct eilenberg um, maclean spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to construct it for Zmod2. Um, but uh, and that gets uh, ugly because um, the way that um, so the way things work is that everything depends on the sort of the size of the cycle you're working with or the size of the interval. That so if you noticed um, in the construction, I was taking this five cycles and I was taking three intervals, and there's a reason that there's this technical condition in the Van Kampen theorem that needs to hold. And so similarly, you have a Mayer-Weyer torus. Uh, so there's also homology theory in a Mayer-Weyer torus. Um, so um, to construct sort of like a model of RP2, um, the issue is that you need to take bigger and bigger um, uh, like phones and sus bigger suspensions. So uh, it sort of gets uh, quite like, yeah, it gets pretty big uh, very quickly. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I think I, I get the idea of where, where, mm -hmm. where the graphs are starting to, to kind of sticking things up and <laughs> Okay, thank you and uh, very lovely talk and great ideas there. Yeah.